Variance 101. This is Lynn Fitzgibbons, and it's March 16th, 2021. Here we see the basic structure of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, including the very important outer spike protein in blue. Remember, this outer spike protein lets the virus attach to a human cell and infect it. We also see the coil or the string of RNA in the middle. This, remember, is the basic code or instructions that the virus carries with it into a human cell. So let's focus in on the RNA and understand it better so that we can understand variants. In the center of the schematic here, we see that familiar coronavirus structure, a different version of the structure we just reviewed, and the spike proteins now in red, as well as the RNA again in a coil inside the lipid membrane. This RNA code is also called the genome of the virus, and it's made up of nucleotides in a particular order. Once the virus infects and enters a cell, the order of nucleotides teaches the cell exactly how to make a copy of the virus, exactly how to make the proteins that are required for a new copy of the virus. The large outer circle in this cartoon helps us envision the whole genome as a long string with different parts of the string holding the code for different parts of the virus. We see in red, for example, the place in the genome where the code for building new spike proteins lies. This is a very important part of the genome as we think about variants. Changes in the code here in this red section encoding the spike protein could and do change important features of that spike protein. Changes here, for example, could result in a change in the shape of the spike protein, perhaps making it stickier or able to bind more tightly to a human cell. A change here could also help disguise the spike protein from antibodies that were made to fight earlier versions of the spike protein. In other words, changes in this part of the genome could potentially make the virus more infectious or perhaps more likely to cause reinfection or even vaccine failure. Thinking about the viral cycle of the SARS-CoV-2 helps us understand variants also. The very important spike protein on the left attaches to a receptor on the blue human cell, the large human cell taking over most of the picture. And once the red spike protein binds to that blue human cell through the ACE2 receptor, a normal part of many human cells, then the virus is now attached and can enter the cell and open up. This lets its RNA genome, the curly blue coil in this picture, interact with normal parts of the human cell and make new copies of itself. Once new copies are made, some of these new copies go on to infect other cells in the same person, but other copies of the virus are shed from that person's mouth, nose, or even their breath and potentially cause new infections. As we look at this process, which is happening trillions of times every day right now, we see just how important that spike protein is. If during this replication cycle, a small change was to occur in the new copy of the RNA, what we would call a mutation, then a slightly different version of the spike protein would be made in the new virus. Changes in any part of the virus, but particularly the spike protein, could give a new version of the virus an advantage. Potential and indeed real life examples of advantages that new versions could have would include perhaps making the new version um, more contagious or infectious, perhaps let that new version cause more severe disease, or again, perhaps allowing the new version of the virus to avoid antibodies or other parts of the immune system that they had developed because of a prior infection or because of vaccination. Without going into the nitty gritty details, here we see the big picture of the SARS-CoV-2 viral family tree. Starting on the left, we can think of these as some of the original or parent viruses that were present over a year ago. And as we move every step to the right, we see that as time passed, changes that have happened in the RNA code have caused new versions of the virus to be recognized and now mapped. Remember that mutations are occurring all the time, and that means that a variety of variants are often circulating in a community and around the world at the same time. As we've talked about, certain factors could lead to specific variants becoming more prevalent or taking over as the more common variant within a population. 
Those factors could be the ones we previously mentioned, being more infectious, perhaps causing a person um, to have more versions of the virus made, and um, perhaps a higher what's called viral load, perhaps cause more severe disease, or again, evade the immune system. Mutations leading to new variants of the virus with one or a collection of mutations have been part of this story for over a year when the D614G um, version or variant was first recognized, and we saw it quickly become the predominant variant around the world. It was thought, and now I think clearly understood, to be more infectious than the other variants which had come before it, and that let it take over. Similarly, these last few months have brought a huge amount of new information regarding specific new variants of concern and variants of interest that are circulating now. As we think about the important variants, it's helpful to review the CDC definitions of both variants of concern and variants of interest currently. The CDC describes and defines three, excuse me, four variants of concern. They define these due to these variants having, again, one of the following. These variants are suspected to be more infectious, perhaps cause more severe disease, or possibly have the ability to evade the immune system even when someone has been previously infected or vaccinated. In addition to the variants of concern, there is increasing information surrounding variants of interest. And these are variants which have been recognized as important and are being actively studied to better understand whether or not they truly have features of concern. As we think about variants of concern and variants of interest, we should remember that the vast majority of positive tests are not being sent currently in the United States for variant testing. The usual PCR or antigen test that we undergo when our doctor wants to understand whether or not we have COVID-19 is not able to determine whether or not there is a variant of concern or a variant of interest. To test for variants, the usual approach involves a more sophisticated and more intensive um, technique called sequencing to actually understand the specific RNA code and compare that sequence to the sequences of different variants of concern, variants of interest, or other variants that we know about. Again, here in summary, the CDC has determined that the B117 variant, originally recognized in the United Kingdom, B1351 from South Africa, P1 recognized to be an important variant, particularly in Brazil um, at the time of its discovery and description. And now, most recently, the CDC has moved the B1427-429, also known as the West Coast variant or paravariants, or also known as Cal20C, uh, into a category of variant of concern. There are several other variants of interest, and all of this information is available on the CDC website, including a dashboard that tracks how frequently and how often these variants are being identified in the United States. This is again a snapshot from the CDC website with a nice summary of one of the variants of concern, B117, including details about its patterns of mutation and an excellent description of what we know about its concerning features on the right. We know, for example, that it is likely more infectious. We know that it's associated with more severe disease now. In fact, um, even in the recent month, and in fact, the recent several days, we've learned that more conclusively. But we know in the bottom comments that it matches up very well against serum from someone who's been vaccinated or previously infected. In other words, the vaccine seems to be a, a really excellent match at this point. A lot of scientific information finds its way into sound bites or short media stories, but I wanted to quickly explain the news that came this week from a high quality article published in Nature. The authors looked at over a million positive COVID cases in the UK between November and February for which they knew whether or not the case was B117 or not. And here we see the results. <clears throat> Just to understand these pictures, remember that SGTF stands for S gene target failure, which is less important. And what is more important is to remember that SGTF for this paper um, was the equivalent of the author saying it was the B117 variant. And on the top left, you see here for the entire data set um, that the B117 in pink was not really present in November. Um, it was actually back in November, mostly the green non-B117, 
that was present in the community samples that were tested by these authors. But by January and February, as you can see, there was a huge shift. And suddenly, it became very clear that B117 was causing the vast majority of infections. In the lower graph on the left, you see the same breakdown by date, but now by deaths. Again, B117 had not been present in November, so not surprising it was not causing death. But by February, you see it was causing almost all deaths. Finally, in the piece of information that has received the most attention this week, the graph on the right shows us the estimated survival over time for those without B117 in green and for those with B117 in red. If no one died within a group, the estimated survival would stay along the top 1.000 level. Unfortunately, people certainly died. And most concerning, those on the red line with B117 were less likely to survive. The authors report an overall difference in survival between the two groups of about 0.64%. And given the size of the data set, this, different, this difference does a, really truly appear to be um, the case. As important as this information is, I want us all to remember that as we hear about the likelihood that B117 causes more severe disease and death, that we have to look and step back at the overall survival. Note that more than 99.4% of both groups survived, and we simply can't lose sight of this. It's important difference, but a slightly more subtle one, especially when we're thinking in the big picture. Here we see yet another example from the CDC website of another variant of concern, the B1351. Again, for those who are interested, the set of mutations and what we know on the right about um, the features that make the CDC concerned. Similarly, P1, and I'll just reference the CDC website for anyone who's more interested in the details of each of these variants of concern, including the nicely referenced information on the right. The West Coast variant, um, perhaps the most important one locally, um, known now to be very prevalent in California. Much is yet to be confirmed about this variant, but we absolutely know that it was likely the most common variant at the peak of our winter surge in many parts of California. We also know that the current vaccines are very well matched against it. And although we learn more about these two West Coast variants every week, we should keep in mind that it is this variant that we are currently beating. All that has changed in recent weeks is that we have learned more about it. But make no mistake, we have been succeeding against these West Coast variants since January. Just to finish with a quick description of the variant testing underway in Santa Barbara County, Testing is increasing through the California Department of Public Health and our local public health lab. This has thus far been smaller volume with longer turnaround times, but lots of work underway to really expand this effort. Um, and there are specific criteria for testing with um, a, a very important focus on patients who are thought to be of higher risk for variants. Um, for example, those who have traveled from a, a variant of concern hotspot, um, those who appear to have uh, infection after a vaccine, among others. And our local health officials um, are following this closely and uh, samples are being sent uh, frequently now to the California Department of Public Health for testing. We also have an exciting collaborative variant testing research project underway. Currently, a partnership between Cottage Health, uh, Pacific Diagnostics Lab, and UC Santa Barbara to help our community understand the prevalence of a variety of variants here in our community. Um, looking forward to future collaborations with Marion Regional Medical Center on this project. To finish up, perhaps just a few reminders. Variants are going to continue to be an important part of this next chapter of the pandemic for us. And the more we learn about variants and the variants circulating in our communities, the stronger and more empowered we are. In many ways, we have not yet been in such a fragile or more critical position as we are currently. We are truly succeeding with dropping case rates and vaccination efforts, leading to increasing protection in our community every day. But we know that more infectious and more dangerous variants have the potential to cause more disruption. Let's stay strong with a recommitment this spring to wearing our masks, 
to staying safe and healthy in this wonderful Santa Barbara outdoor climate as much as possible. And let's also commit to getting our vaccines when it's our turn. These vaccines continue to work incredibly well against the variants that are circulating. Thank you.